Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about how your brain figures out what it, you like to do and then teaches you that you should do it because it's either fun or necessary for your survival. So the title of the talk is How Your Brain Encodes a Prediction Error Signal, Summary of an Experiment on Monkey Dopamine Neurons. I'll start off this talk with a discussion of what a neuron is and how it's arranged in your brain. Then we'll talk about how neurons communicate in your brain. And then we'll talk about the experiment where monkeys were actually taught to move their eyeballs from left to right with a specific delay. And the reward that they got was based on how long they waited to move their eyes to look at a light. The longer they waited, the bigger, and I don't know why monkeys like water so much, but somehow milliliters of water was their reward. The longer they waited, the more milliliters of water they got, but if they waited too long, they didn't get any water at all. And monkeys are pretty smart. They, they figure this out pretty quickly. Recall that movement of your eyes, a saccade, and there are actually machines that can measure monkey eye movement. And so that's how this is done. And I'll show you some pictures of how the monkeys got hooked up for the experiments and what gets measured in their brains. Okay? Oops. Okay, so this is a neuron. And uh, I know you've all had 113, so you know what a neuron looks like. And a neuron does not look like a regular cell. In fact, a neuron has kind of these protrusions we call dendrites with these little things that point out called spines and this is the cell soma this is where the, the DNA is it's like the cell nucleus and then they all have this long protruding thing called an axon and they only have one axon and the axon protrudes out and the axon is where the message gets sent so a message starts up here. The message is integrated by the neuron. And if the message is strong enough, the message will originate here and pass all the way down this long axon and come out this other end. Now when it gets to the end of the neuron, it has to talk to the next neuron. Okay? So the neurons form networks. And this is a, this is a network of neurons in your cortex, which is the part of your brain that makes you your human. It's the part of your brain that's more advanced and more developed than other mammals. And these are all uh, neurons. You can see that there are, are soma with nuclei and long axons all interconnecting. And all of the dendrites and axons touch each other and they connect to each other. And the axon sends a message to the next neuron and that's how your brain communicates. It's a constant just situation in which neurons are communicating with billions and billions of other neurons and there are actually a hundred billion neurons in your brain and there are between a thousand and five thousand connections for every one of those hundred billion neurons and that means there's between a hundred trillion and five hundred trillion connections in your brain. Imagine building a computer that had five hundred connections to it, five hundred trillion connections to it. Okay, so when the message gets to the bottom of that long skinny axon, that we call that an action potential, when that electrical signal gets all the way to the bottom here, some things happen where these little vesicles that hold a substance called a neurotransmitter are. Okay? So these little vesicles hold neurotransmitters. So some of the neurotransmitters are serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, and when that electrical signal gets here, this little vesicle will go to the surface here, fuse with the membrane, the cell membrane, spill its contents into this gap, okay, spill its neurotransmitter contents into this gap, and the neurotransmitter will go across the very tiny gap and bond to a receptor on the other side. This is very specific. If this is dopamine, that's a dopamine receptor. If this is serotonin, that's a serotonin receptor. 
Okay? So when that happens and that dopamine goes across this gap and binds to the receptor, it instigates that process we talked about in the last slide where the soma gets all excited and if enough excitement happens, another signal originates at the, in the axon and passes on to the next neuron. Okay, so this is how your, your brains communicate, your neurons communicate with each other in your brain. Okay? Now what happens is, the way things are arranged in your brain, is that the somas with the cell nucleus will often be in one part of your brain, for example, in this ventral tegmental area, or this substantia nigra, these two parts. And the axons will often go out of that into other parts of your brain. So the machinery to make dopamine might be here, but the dopamine doesn't get produced and spilled out till it gets here. And the way this works is all these areas are interconnected. So a dopamine neuron that's right here in the ventral tegmental area talks to the amygdala, the nucleus accumbens, prefrontal cortex, and I'll tell you what these areas do. The amygdala is the fear center of your brain. When you look at a face like this and you see a scary person, your amygdala will light up. That's a survival, that's a survival skill. If you can't recognize scary faces in the olden days, chances are you probably wouldn't have survived. So the amygdala is the fear center of your brain. It's what recognizes fear, experiences fear, and makes us act on fear. The nucleus accumbens is the addiction center of your brain. When, when a person becomes addicted to a drug, the thing that is the most active in that process of addiction is the nucleus accumbens. That's why it's called the addiction center of the brain. And the frontal cortex is your decision making and your consequences site in your brain. Your prefrontal cortex is what makes humans more in, uh, intelligent and more introspective and better judges of things than mammals, for instance. So when you're faced with a decision about whether you like something or not, these dopamine neurons whose cell bodies are right here will send signals out to these other areas. And here's what happens. You ask yourself, is this good for me or should I be afraid of it? Then you ask yourself, how good does this make me feel and do I want more? And the other thing is that your, your frontal cortex says, ah, but is this such a good idea? Should you be doing this? We'll take as an example shopping. And shopping is something that a lot of people like. So maybe your amygdala says, oh my God, if you shop too much and spend on your credit card, you'll get your credit card revoked and that's not a very good thing, so you're afraid of that. But your nucleus comes and says, but God, you love shopping. You like getting new clothes and you don't, don't really think about the charge card while you're shopping. And then your prefrontal cortex says, hold on a minute, let's evaluate how much we like versus what we're afraid of and decide whether we should actually go shopping or not. And you can imagine this happening with things like drugs, sex, or anything you can get addicted to, gambling, alcohol. That's the process that goes on in your brain. Now the other process involving dopamine originates in this part of your brain. That's called the substantia nigra. What this does is it sends signals to the part of your brain that controls your movement. So that if you're going to engage in a rewarding behavior, your, this part of your brain will say, engage your muscles into this rewarding behavior. Get in your car and drive to the store. Or pick up that glass and drink it. Okay, so this is about motivation and movement for reward, and this is about addiction and an appreciation of reward. But both of those are dopamine systems. And the names for that, this is the nigrostriatal, and this is what's called the mesolimbic dopamine system. Now what's interesting as an aside for you is, if you know anything about Parkinson's disease, the part of the brain that dies when a person gets Parkinson's disease are the dopamine neurons whose cell bodies are right here. Those die, and because of that, people have the typical symptoms you associate with Parkinson's disease. Because that, that's about movement. That part of this part of your brain is about movement. Okay? And then when you take things like d drugs that cause you to get addicted, like cocaine, that sort of activity occurs in the nucleus accumbens. Okay? Okay, so I'm going to show you this, this setup. This is um, 
interesting. This is a, a monkey, okay, that's sitting at a little uh, workstation with his little uh, brain hat on that is probably has little electrodes that come out of it, and they go into his brain. Um, this is what it looks like close up. And then the electrodes will go into certain parts of the brain. And I don't get the impression that this is particularly painful. Um, they tend to try and be very humane with this. But this does teach us a lot. And what the happens is when the monkey's brain fires, there are uh, probes that pick up the electrical current in his brain. And they actually put the probes right in those two spots on the previous two slides that I showed you. And then they watch the neurons fire when the monkey undergoes various tasks. And uh, I've actually seen this type of equipment close up. I don't actually work with animals myself. I'm a data scientist, not a lab scientist. Um, then when the monkey gets um, the activity that he's going to do, he may get a reward. That, and this might be like orange juice. For some reason, some monkeys love orange juice, too. And, then, and, and they will do stuff for orange juice. And they also like raisins and water, and they love sugar water a lot. Actually, they like sugar water better than cocaine, strangely. Um, so anyway, so the monkeys do this, and then um, we use these, these type of readings that we get from watching electrical activity in those centers of the brain. That's what we get when we say watching neurons fire. What that means is watching neurons fire means that we're monitoring the electrical activity in those particular sections of the brain that have the electrodes sticking in them. And it's extremely precise. We get it down to very narrow areas of interest, including putting it in just one neuron. Isn't that crazy? OK. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the concepts of reward and firing of dopamine neurons. So um, there's three situations that can occur. The first situation is the monkey was expecting nothing. This is like you expecting no present from your mother or, or your boyfriend or girlfriend. Nothing, you expect nothing. You have no anticipations, no expectations. But all of a sudden, a box of cookies shows up from your mother. In this particular case, this could be some drops of orange juice to the monkey. And if you look, you can see that this is where the monkey got the reward. And this is his, the dopamine neurons firing. Notice over here, this has no condition stimulus. Okay, no, nothing happened, no indication, no pre-warning. Cookies show up from your mother, monkey gets orange juice, dopamine neurons in your ventral tegmental area fire and send that dopamine all over your brain. Okay. Now, the next trick is to, is to either ring a bell or have a little bing or something like that we call it the condition stimulus. And then a few seconds later, we give the monkey the reward. Now, the first time that happens, the monkey goes, I, and they, they actually do scratch their heads. Um, monkey says, that's interesting. Then we do it again. Bell rings, some microseconds later, monkey gets orange juice. And the monkey says, okay, that's interesting too. Then it happens again. And then it happens again. And pretty soon, the monkey starts to associate that bell ringing with orange juice. That means that his brain now associates the reward not with the orange juice, but with the, the bell ringing. And the monkey's neurons fire when the condition stimulus occurs, when the bell rings. The monkey has learned a very valuable lesson here that, oh, when that bell happens, I'm going to get some orange juice. So now instead of firing when he gets the orange juice, they fire when he gets the bell ringing. Now we're going to change the experiment a little bit. And the next time what we do is we ring the bell and we don't give the monkey any juice at all. And look what happens to the monkey's neurons. They depress. See, there's tonic level of activity in dopamine neurons in your brain. There's always a tonic level. We call that a, a constant level. But when that monkey doesn't get that reward that he was expecting or she was expecting, his tonic level ceases to fire. And the neurons actually become depressed. So what this says is, if you've got somebody in your life conditioned to your behavior in a certain way, 
and you don't do it, they're a whole lot unhappier than if you'd never started doing it in the first place. And your neurons will depress when the expectation of the reward is not met. So that's an interesting phenomenon because it means that expectations, when, when disappointment occurs, are a worse situation than never having been promised anything at all. It's a good strategy to remember when we all become parents. Okay, now here's another situation which is also interesting. So here we have a surprise reward, just like before. No, no, nothing fires at the light. The light, is now, the light is now the conditioned stimulus, right? So now we have this light as a conditioned stimulus. And boom, no surprise, no reward. Surprise occurs, reward shows up, and dopamine neurons fire like crazy. So that's the same as the previous situation, the very first uh, picture. But, and again, now, we get the monkey used to the fact that the light signals that they're going to be getting a reward, and sure enough, the monkey's dopamine neurons start to fire at the sight of the light, which for that monkey in this particular experiment, but they don't fire when he actually gets the reward, because you know what? He already knew it way back when, so no reward. In this case, they start another cue. Maybe it's a bell ring and then a light. And as you would probably predict, eventually the monkey's neurons start to fire at the first cue. And they don't fire at the second cue or the reward. So let's think about this for a minute and how this would relate to our regular life. So tell me about shopping. Give me an example of like well, how this would happen with us. Like think about shopping and your dopamine neurons firing. When would your dopamine neurons fire? Well, at the very thought of shopping, right? As soon as you start thinking about it, oh, I'm going shopping tomorrow. That's when your dopamine neurons start to fire. It's the same actually with, with gambling. The thought of addictive behavior is what makes the neurons fire eventually. They always fire to the most proximal cue. So one of the most important pr uh, principles of helping people recover from addictions is that they have to get out of the environment in which the addiction was active. If you're still hanging out with all the same old friends who did the same bad habits, or you're still living in Las Vegas and you're trying to get over your gambling addiction, that's not a wise strategy. Because the mere thought of gambling will send your dopamine neurons into high overdrive. That's why oftentimes people who are in addiction centers are told to move away from their set of friends that they had because the friends become the source of the satisfaction to them because that's what they tie in their minds to their addictive behavior. So we have some questions here. Does our brain evaluate and keep track of past rewards for the purpose of learning? Does our brain compare past rewards to current rewards? and adjust its neuronal firing rate in relation to what it got versus what it thought it was going to get, i.e. does it calculate a prediction error. So I think I'm going to get a, re a certain reward and then I get a reward. <coughs> Did my brain have any preconception of what I was going to get based on past experience? Like maybe every Friday your mother sends you cookies? And so you, every Friday you expect cookies. And unless your mother changes her cookie recipe, eventually your brain becomes pretty used to the same cookie recipe. And there's an interesting uh, phenomenon associated with that when your brain is used to getting something over and over again. How exactly does our brain do the math of calculating and encoding such a positive null or negative prediction error? And how could the brain use such information for learning? So this is kind of like a primitive attempt to model a brain neural network, right? So here are the, the sort of the, the basic situations. Um, in the first situation, you had no prediction or cue. You had no concept you were going to get a reward. You got a reward. Uh, the prediction error is positive, And the association weights 
for whatever you did to get that award go up. So that activity and your perception of it and your reward are now have a positive association. We call it an association weight or a learning rate. Another alternative is you found out about a cue. You had a cue. There was a light. There was a bell. You got your reward. Interestingly, if you get a reward for one you expected, there's no change in your brain. If you get what you expected, your brain is happy but not unhappy. But it's not like overjoyed. It's, it's content, but it's not particularly ecstatic. And situation three is there was the cue, a light or a bell. You got no reward. And so you had a negative prediction error. And so your brain is very unhappy and it depresses its dopamine signaling. And that tells you what, and now think about this for a minute as to how it relates to a person. Supposing there was a person in your life who constantly did nice things for you, and then all of a sudden for no reason they apparently stopped doing good things for you. Maybe it's your, your boyfriend or girlfriend or uh, your roommate. You're more upset about the fact that they stopped doing it than the fact that you, would, if you had never gotten anything from them in the first place. So let's talk a little bit about human behavior and how our expectations come to drive our perceptions of people and our relationships. So prediction error is proportional to the difference between the actual reward you got on that, that trial and then the expected reward based on all your past history with whomever you were dealing with or whatever experience you were having. Your brain makes a prediction and says, huh, I didn't get exactly what I expected. Maybe I should alter my behavior next time. Or I got more than I expected. I'm definitely altering my behavior next time. Okay, so here's, here's our experiment now. This is this particular experiment. And the point of this experiment was to see if we could quantify, see if we could quantify prediction error. Could we put it, can we actually figure out how much of your past drives your behavior? So the way this worked is there was a center light in front of the monkeys and then a side light over here. Okay, we call it that the eccentric light. And when the trial starts, a few microseconds later, or milliseconds later, the monkey hears a beep. Then the center light goes on. Okay. Now, the monkey will stare at that center light because it's a, it's a novel experience and the monkey finds the light interesting. It's not so bright. Then eventually, after the monkey has looked at the center light, that light will go red and the eccentric light will turn on. So now the monkey sees the yellow light over there. And in the space of some time after that yellow light on the side goes on, the monkey has to wait. And then it waits and it's the cause toward the light. The monkey wait, can wait however long the monkey chooses. It's several, up to several milliseconds. So, and then the monkey learns, hey, if I wait in this neat, my dopamine neurons will fire because, whoops, I got a reward. So the monkey gets a reward, and interestingly, this reward that the monkey gets at that point in time is directly related to how long the monkey waited before he moved his eyes to the light. So the monkey had, okay, and this is what's called implicit learning. There's no directions, he's not studying a textbook, nobody's giving him instructions. This is something the monkey is learning, like in the Gluck video, remember the Mark Gluck video where the person had to learn about what the card, whether the cards predicted, but there were no explicit instructions, it was based strictly on intuition. The monkey's decision to wait is based strictly on the monkey's intuition that he, he builds based on the rewards he receives. Eventually, on a very subconscious level, his basal ganglia neurons and reward center neurons figure out that the longer he waits, the more water that he gets. And this actually, in this case, was actually a water reward. Okay, 
So what we want to do now is try and find a mathematical model that describes how the dopamine neurons respond to a learning-based reward, an implicit learning-based reward. And the neuron firing rate is proportional to the reward that the brain gets versus the reward that the brain expected. And where does the brain learn what it expected? Like all of us learn what we expect from past experience. So this is called the reward prediction error. And that's called the reward prediction error. That difference right there, that prediction error. And um, the reward prediction error is, is proportional to the current reward. That's the one you got for this particular trial minus the weighted average of past rewards. So what we do is we take the current reward and we compare it to what we expected and we get a difference between that and that forms the brain's <coughs> perception and the neurons will fire not in proportion to what we got but in proportion to <coughs> this difference. It's kind of like a neural net signaling tool. So if this difference carried any real information, then the actual neuron firing rate would be mathematically related to the magnitude of this reward prediction error. This is the theory that the scientists who were doing this experiment with the um, monkeys and the light were going to do. They said if we can quantify the neuron firing, which they could because they had electrodes sitting in the neurons, they could actually get the intensity of the signals that the neurons were putting out. If we could quantify that, can we link it to some mathematical model. In fact, we can. And here's the model they came up with. The neuron firing rate is equal to the weight on the current reward times the current reward amount in some, some um, units. For example, it could, could be milliliters of water or milliliters of orange juice. Then plus the weight on the most recent past reward times that reward. So that, that's, that's the time before the last one. And all the way up to the reward, say 10 back, and that reward. Does your brain keep track of all of those rewards? And if it does, does it weight those rewards to figure out how the neurons fire? Okay? Does it weight those rewards? And do your neurons fire in proportion to something in this equation that gives us some degree of neuron firing. So the simplest case would be if in this equation the only thing your brain ever remembered was this time and one before. Okay, it's a very poorly designed neural network. It only learns from the last example. It'd be like if you know your mother was trying to train their child to do something and all the child remembered was the last time she talked to them instead of the last ten times she talked to them. So this would be the model would be the neuron firing rate would be equal to the this reward times its learning rate plus the last reward times its learning rate. And it turns out, interestingly, that previous rewards in, in this model will turn out to be negative. <clears throat> so it might be, for example, that the learning rate was 1 times the number of milliliters of water minus 1 times the number of milliliters of water for the time before the last time that we did this experiment. And so if we did this and we looked at the firing, let's pretend for a minute that this rate of firing went with that amount of water and this rate of firing went through that amount of water. And our brain will now fire, interestingly, at a lower level based on past experience. So what does this tell you about addiction? So what does this tell you about what it takes to keep you happy if you're addicted to something over time? Do you need more of that substance to be happier? You need more of the experience to be happier. You need to gamble more to be happier. You need to shop more. And, and interestingly enough, for serial killers, that's why serial killers always up their game every time they kill someone, because the excitement of it is not the same unless they up their game. That's why serial killers always progress in the level of, um, uh, of the, you know, the, 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 the degree of the crime for that exact reason. And that's why people gamble more over time, people take more drugs over time, people shop more over time and spend more money. 
because your brain gets dulled to what you get because it expected something and in order to surprise you and make you happy the intensity of the experience has to increase and therein lies the problem with addiction so <clears throat> this is a positive prediction error the subject says to itself I must have done this correct because my neurons fired more. Therefore, whatever I did this time, I should do again. The subject's brain has learned from the rewards for doing whatever it was supposed to do. For the monkeys, it was waiting the right amount of time before saccading to the light. That seems so simplistic, and it's, but it's very elegant. Okay, so we're gonna develop a linear regression analysis to test this. So we're going to weight the current reward with a, with a learning rate called B0. That's the learning rate. It's like a neural network learning rate. Then we're going to weight the most recent past reward, the most recent past rewards. And we're going to go back in this experiment, because this is the, what the, they chose to do, only back to the 10th most previous reward. So if they do this experiment 100 times, the only rewards they're going to look at is the previous 10. Okay. And so what we're going to do is if we have 125 trials of this monkey saccading for the light to, the, to get water, we're going to start with the 11th trial and we're going to set up the equation for all 115 remaining trials and solve for the values of the 11 weighting coefficients, B0 through B10. And this is what it would look like. So this is trial 11, and we're going to go back and look at all the coefficients for the rewards for the previous 10 rewards. So we're going to go back from B0 back to B10. For trial 12, we go back to the trial 11, back to trial 2. For trial 13, we go back to the current one, less, and trial 12, back to trial 3. So these are the 10 most recent rewards experiences prior to that trial. So this goes to that trial, this goes to that trial, but these are the previous 10. You notice it's kind of a moving target. Now you're always slipping back 10. So every time you take a new trial, it's the previous 10. So this forms independent information from which to optimize these coefficients. The B1, the B0, the B1, the B2, the B3, back down to the B10. And what this will tell us if we do this, is which of these have non-zero values? Which of these betas has a non-zero value? That will tell us whether or not the monkey took subconsciously into account that trial in his anticipation of the water reward. Okay? Is anybody just off the top of your head, have any guesses to how many times the monkey might subconsciously remember rewards? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, 12? Do you think all those betas will be zero? zero? Will all those betas be non-zero? How many of those betas might be, might be non-zero? How many times? Yeah. Are all of them non-zero? That's a good guess. Uh, that's what they initially guessed. It turns out that only the last six trials We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but, but yes, uh, your monkey remembers back pretty far on a very subconscious, implicit learning level. Now, if you ask the monkey that, do you think the monkey knows that he measured in his brain six rewards? No. Do you know in your brain that you measured six rewards? If you were doing that experiment with Mark Gluck and the cards, remember the weather predicting cards? <coughs> Would you remember that it was the last six cards that you learned from? You probably would not consciously remember that, but your brain certainly does. So I want to show you how you would set up this matrix if you were doing this. If you were going to do this experiment and set up this matrix, you would take, uh, so this is trial number 11. So this is the average neuron firing rate. So you're going to measure some average neuron firing rate. Those were the little up and down things like that, remember? You put it right there. Then you're going to put the reward for trial 11 right there because that's the one that matches. And then here's the trials 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. These are the previous 10 trials. And multiply 
this times this plus 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 this times this and set it equal to the average normal firing rate. Then you're going to move on to trial 12 and do exactly the same thing. Trial 12 and then trials 11 down through 2. Trial 13. Trials 13 down through 3. And every time you do this, you're multiplying the previous most mem recent memory <coughs> times its value and the previous previous and the previous previous previous. And if this is a valid model, how do you think this is going to work out? Statistically, from a statistical point of view, now you've all had 251 and you know about coefficients of linear models, right? That's like the slope and intercept. Well, this is the slope and intercept of a 10, of an 11 dimensional model. <laughs> well, you'll get some, some values for the betas and you'll get very good indicators that these betas are reliable. So when you do your analysis of variance investigation, you'll get very good information from the data that these betas are reliable, they're not random, they're not just happenstance, you're going to get statistical information that tells you that the betas are quote unquote statistically valid. Okay. Okay, so again I'll rephrase, the goal was to find the values for all the betas to see if the linear regression could accurately model a difference in the amount of neuron firing after the current reward compared to what the previous 10 rewards would pick. And this is basically a, a, a model of prediction error. So then they did this and they found out some interesting things. The beta zero was positive. Beta zero is the learning rate that goes with the most recent activity. It's the one that just happened. And that was positive. But all the other betas were negative. And they subtracted from the validity of your most recent memory. And therein kind of lies the crux of the idea of addiction. If you expect something, your neurons are going to fire less than if you didn't expect it at all. That's why surprises are wonderful. And they're more wonderful than things you anticipate. So the neuron firing rate was equal to B0 times the most recent reward minus the linear combination of all the previous 10 rewards. That's what the model says. The learning rate times the current reward minus the sum of the learning rates times all the past rewards. And again, it is this term here that is, that is the, the Achilles heel of addiction, is that when you expect it or get used to it, your poor dopamine neurons don't get as happy. They also found that only the first six beta eyes were non-zero. That, that, and that, by that I mean this set of beta eyes, beta one through beta six. After six rewards, your brain doesn't remember anymore. But it, but it does remember the past six. And so this is what the equation actually ended up looking like. The one that would predict the firing would be Dopamine neuron firing rate is equal to the current reward times its learning rate, which was the optimized value of beta from the linear model. And then all these other betas, this beta times that, and this beta times that, and this beta times that, all the way down to beta six times the six past reward. All the other ones before, after that were zero. Interestingly, and this is, not, this, is, this is very interesting and not a surprise, the magnitudes of these beta i's were distributed exponentially. So it kind of looked a little bit like this. If you were gonna, if we're gonna just use the positive value, the positive value of beta, and we'll assume it's minus a positive beta, then if this is the last trial, this is the most current last trial, right here, this is, and this is the second last trial, and the third last trial, and the fourth to the last trial, in the fifth to the last trial, and the sixth to the last trial, that and this is this is the current reward. That if you look up here and you modeled it, it would kind of look a little bit like this. In other words, <coughs> magnitude of those beta i's decreases exponentially. So this is this previous reward 
before the one that just happened, this most previous expected value reward, that is the most remembered in the brain. And the reason we know it's the most remembered is because up there in that picture, of all of these, beta 1 has the highest magnitude. And of course the magnitudes then decrease. And so it says that, well, eventually your brain gets to the point where it doesn't remember six times ago. Now this is kind of an interesting phenomenon. And I, one of my previous lifetimes, I was actually an operations management person. And I remember very vividly something from my experience with quality control. And I remember that there's a um, um, uh, statement in quality control that says, if you make somebody happy, they remember that, if, you're, if they're your customer. But if you make somebody mad in your company, they have one bad experience with your company, it takes seven times of good experiences for that person to forget that they had an unhappy experience with your company. That's a pretty well-held well maxim in quality control. It takes seven positive experiences to undo a very negative experience with a company. And that's kind of interesting that our brain remembers not only the most that, that experience, but it remembers back six experiences. And so to wipe out the thing that happened seven times ago, you've got to have six more experiences plus the current one to forget that bad experience. And we've all had a bad experience with a company in our lives. And we know that we don't forget very easily. And plus, what else do we do with bad experiences? We tell our friends. So that's an important thing to remember, is that your brain does remember. <clears throat> the relationship between firing rate and the reward history is indeed linear for positive reward prediction errors. And what we found out from this is that it's positive re prediction errors that have the most impact. It's positive things that most affect your brain. If there was a disappointing result, i.e. the negative prediction error, neurons the scientists were monitoring did not change their firing rate from the basal level. They went quiet, except for the baseline firing. So disappointing results, bad news. If you're expecting something and you don't get it, that's worse than expecting nothing at all. And so the expectations that we set up in people have a great impact on how they view us. And so if do dopamine neurons go quiet for negative prediction error, what encodes negative prediction error? So there's also a negative prediction error. Well, possibly other, other neurons, other dopamine neurons. It turns out there are actually two dopamine neuron pathways in the brain. One of them is called the direct pathway and one is called the indirect pathway. It turns out that if the reward was better than predicted, that the direct pathway fires. And the dopamine neurons get all excited and they send their axon potentials everywhere and they have synapses releasing dopamine and you feel really good. So that's the direct pathway. It turns out there is a second population of dopamine neurons that have different types of receptors. And that's called the indirect pathway. And that is the one that, it, that if it's worse than predicted, these are the ones that suppress firing of dopamine neurons. They fire, but they, they get excited, but they actually suppress firing. And so remember when it took the dip there, when you didn't get what you expected? That's because these other population of neurons actually suppress the tonic level. So there's different populations of dopamine neurons in your brains. One for when you get what you expected, and one for when you don't get what you expected. Now interestingly, in movement, in our bodies, there are two pathways for movement in our basal ganglia, a direct pathway and an indirect pathway. And as it turns out, what's interesting is this pathway causes movement and this pathway suppresses movement. So just like that, it works with rewards, it also works with movement. And interestingly, Parkinson's disease is a disease where both of these pathways get messed up because the dopamine neurons that fire don't fire and you get a huge mismatch in the brain between the action of the, the direct pathway and the action of the indirect pathway. And when you don't get the proper amounts of motivation for movement and suppression of unwanted movement, that's why people who have Parkinson's disease often shake. Because the interaction of the stimulation of movement and the suppression of unwanted movement are out of balance. 
And so when a person who has Parkinson's disease keeps their hands still, it will often shake because the suppression of unwanted movement has been ruined by the lack of dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra. Because that, that is all about movement. And why is this tied into the reward pathway? Because we have to be motivated to move to get rewards. So back in the days when men hunted on the Serengeti Plain for dinner, right? If you were hungry and you had to eat because your stomach was rolling, you had to be motivated to move. So your need for things like procreating or eating has to be tied to your capability to move. That's why the reward pathway and the movement pathway are so intricately linked. Because if you can't, if one to sit here and feel hungry and say, God, I'm really starving. But if you can't get up and go to the refrigerator, you're going to continue to sit there and starve. And so that's why in the olden days, we tied our movement pathway to our reward pathway. So when we needed a reward, like eating or procreating, which were basically all we did back in the olden days, then we had to motivate ourselves to move, to go get it, to go, to go hunting, or to get up and fix a dinner. If we were the, you know, the mother in the cave making dinner for the family. If we weren't motivated, we couldn't move. And so that's why our movement system and our motivation system are so strongly tied together. Because if you don't have motivation to move, you won't move. And if you can't move, your motivation doesn't matter. So this is um, some summary remarks that I have about this whole thing. And that is, dopamine neurons become habituated to a stimulus. That is, they decrease their firing response <coughs> over time to the same level of stimulus. And therein lies the crux of the addiction issue. That's kind of like it right there in a sentence. Since over time, neurons habituate to a stimulus, the intensity of the activity must increase to obtain the, obtain the same level of neuron, neuron activity that makes your brain really happy. So as a result, it takes more gambling, sex, shopping, or eating to evoke the same dopamine neuron firing response. Also, over time, the brain starts to recognize the cue as the signal of the impending reward. And then the dopamine neurons begin to fire to the cue. And that precedes the activity that has the reward. And it's the activity that has the reward that no longer stimulates us, but it's the anticipation of the reward that now stimulates us the very thoughts of shopping, or seeing your significant other, or going home to mom's chocolate chip cookies. If the rewarded activity is preceded by a series of cues, the dopamine neurons will always back propagate and fire to the earliest reliable cue. They only fire once. When you get whatever signal you learn that means something, that's when they will fire. So eventually, it isn't the actual gambling, sex, shopping, or eating that evokes a happy feeling. It's the anticipation of those things that causes the dopamine neurons to fire. Your brain has learned very effectively that the cue means the reward is coming. And it will do that little calculation. It will do the little calculation and fire itself based on past experience. That's um, all I have to say. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Um, yeah. How recently was the Loki experiment performed? Oh, that's a really good question. I have a paper right here. Two thousand and five. Okay. Two thousand and five. All the yes, the post, the slide should be posted, and all of the. Work is cited on the slide, so if you on the PowerPoint, so if you check that, it'll be there. But that, yeah, and there have been lots and lots of experiments since then. I mean, there have been experiments looking at um, the suppression of firing. There are also experiments that look at how the prefrontal cortex will evaluate the reward and the activity to make the decision about whether or not you should do it. So this is the brain, the fight your brain has when you have a chance to go partying versus knowing you have a test tomorrow. What do you do? So the prefrontal cortex also fires, and there are other pathways that fire uh, 
when that decision is going on in your brain so that your reward circuits get tied to your moral decision making and your consequences center. Now an interesting fact, in case you didn't know it, is that the prefrontal cortex, which actually makes these evaluations between reward and consequences, does not mature in the average person until they're almost 25 years old. So your brains are still in formation right now, forming moral decision making centers, consequences centers, and, it, and learning to evaluate consequences against um, possible uh, feelings of feeling great. And that's why a lot of times you messed up your freshman year, but by the time you're juniors and seniors, it's a whole different story. And a lot of that you can just say, blame it on, blame it on your prefrontal cortex, because it's actually, it's actually true um, that the prefrontal cortex does not formally, full, it's full, formally um, fulfill all its connections with all the, you know, its integrated parts um, until you're um, close to 25 years old. Any other questions? Great. Okay, well, I will see you all, I hope sometime maybe. And I enjoyed this opportunity. And I hope you all, I hope you learned something. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> then,